Okay, um, so we're going to get started with the chapter two workshop. Um, I don't like to rank the importance of chapters in books that I write, but if I had to pick one, this is probably the most important chapter, um, certainly for understanding the basics, which is relevant to most of what we do. Uh, so this chapter talks about mechanisms of photoluminescence and excited state dynamics, so sort of two intertwined topics. Uh, it builds off of some of the things we covered last time in some of the review material, so I'll try to refer back to that as much as I can. Uh, as usual, please um, stop me with any questions you have along the way, so you can feel free to interrupt at any point. I'll get a pen out just in case you need it. Let's write stuff down. All right, so the first thing we're going to cover in this chapter are some definitions that are important for us. Uh, so obviously, the one of the overarching themes of this whole thing is luminescence, and it, in general terms, can be thought it is the emission of energy as a photon, so it's any sort of, can ha happen with you know atoms, molecules, materials, whatever the case is, it, if it gives off energy in the form of, of light or electromagnetic radiation, that would be called luminescence. And then within luminescence, there's a few different subcategories. The one that we will almost exclusively talk about in this is photoluminescence, and as we will describe today, and as you're likely already familiar with, photoluminescence is luminescence that occurs following excitation by light absorption. So with any type of luminescence, there has to be an input of energy first in some form to, to give it that extra energy that it then emits as a photon. And so for photoluminescence, it absorbs a photon at one wavelength and then will emit at a different wavelength. So that's what we mean by photoluminescence. And then uh, the other subcategory that is somewhat relevant to the work that we do um, although we don't study it in our own lab, is electroluminescence. And so this is when your excited state energy is provided by an electrical potential prior to luminescence. And that would be, so any sort of electroluminescent device would be things like OLEDs anytime when you're using electrical energy to convert into light. And then the other type that we really won't talk about at all, but you may be familiar with in some other context, is chemiluminescence. And this is when you have a chemical reaction that generates an excited state as a product that then results in luminescence from that product. So it requires some sort of chemical transformation to occur prior to the luminescence. So in this case, you don't need a light or electrical excitation source. It's just the chemical reaction itself that provides the, the energy that's needed. So those are three categories of luminescence, but again, photoluminescence is really the only one we'll talk about in detail. Within photoluminescence, there are two major mechanisms that we will talk about a lot today. So one is fluorescence, um, and we talked last time about how we have different ways of denoting the ground state and the excited state, different notations for that, and they're principally going to be characterized by their relative spin state. So in most cases, it's either single or triplet, as we talked about, but there can be other spin states involved as well. So fluorescence is when luminescence occurs from an excited state that has the same spin multiplicity as the ground state. So usually that means singlet to singlet. So it goes to a single excited state and then relaxes to the singlet ground state. But it could also involve other states as well if the ground state is not a singlet. So it's any time that the luminescence comes from an excited state where the spin is the same as the ground state. And then phosphorescence is luminescence that occurs which involves a change in spin multiplicity. So this is when the excited state that you're luminescing from has a different spin than the ground state that you're going back to. So the most common one is triplet to singlet, which is what we'll talk about a lot today. But again, it could be, we'll see an example later on in this course that's doublet to quartet. It's anytime there's two different spin states involved. It doesn't have to be singlet and triplet. It's just when they're, whether they're the same or whether they're different designates fluorescence versus phosphorescence. All right, so let's talk about how we distinguish these, um, again, with those definitions in mind. And this is going to be a, an oversimplified animation that just shows two energy levels, HOMO and LUMO. So again, we reviewed last time the concept of energy levels in different molecules and materials. And in molecules, you typically have molecular orbitals, where one of them is going to be defined as the HOMO with the electron filled up filled with electrons in the ground state, and then your lowest unoccupied is your LUMO. So these can be distinguished in a simple way by just looking at a, at a diagram like this. And then you have to get the arrow back, don't I? 
Okay, so let's watch what happens there. So in fluorescence, you're going to see excitation, and typically the excitation events occur with retention of spin. So go to that single excited state first, and then in fluorescence, it will directly relax back down and produce the photon. In phosphorescence, you initially populate the single state most often, but then before luminescence occurs, an electron flips to the triplet, and it will relax back down with another spin flip because it has to return back to the original spin state to occupy the same HOMO, and that gives you phosphorescence. So that's really the only difference between them. Um, but of course, the, the diagram like this that just shows two electrons and two orbital levels leaves out a lot of complexity, and some of that complexity is actually very important. Um, so it doesn't show the relative energies of the singlet and triplet state, because in addition to just the orbital energy gaps, you also have exchange interactions with the electrons, which are especially prominent in phosphorescence where the two electrons are of the same spin. And so this doesn't show anything about the relative energies of the states. It also doesn't show the kinetics of the process, and it doesn't recognize that most of many cases the single and triple states are not just homo to lumo transitions, but are multi-configurational with other orbitals involved as well. So to summarize things in a lot more detail, and a lot, no, I don't want to play the video again, get out of here. All right. Um, to summarize things in a lot more detail, uh, what we use are Jablonski diagrams. And again, our group is likely familiar with these because we talk about them all the time. Um, but before we show you a Jablonski diagram and point out all the different features and all the different processes that are represented, let's first go through some abbreviations and definitions. So the first thing is that in a Jablonski diagram, it is an energy level diagram. So the vertical scale will be relative energy. You'll have ground state at the bottom. And then whatever excited states are shown in the diagram will be arranged above that. Um, at minimum, you're going to have you know, two energy levels, one ground state, one excited state, but sometimes Jablonski diagrams are more complicated than that and show multiple energy levels, whether it be however many excited states you need to consider. The horizontal lines represent those energy levels. Um, so again, each, whether it's the ground state or each excited state that's shown is going to have its own horizontal line associated with it. And then what is um, you know, those, those energy levels are going to be labeled in some way, and we talked about the different labeling conventions in the last workshop. Most often in Jablonski diagrams, you'll see the ST convention, where again, S means singlet, T means triplet state, and the subscripted number tells you the sort of relative ordering of those states. Um, so S0 would be your ground state in almost every case, S1 would be your first excited state, T1 would be your first triplet excited state, and, and so on. So those are the labels that are most common, and that's what our Jablonski diagram will have that I'll show today. And then sometimes in, in the, the vibrational energy levels will be shown, and those are included in the Jablonski diagram that I will put up here. So that adds some complexity, but also shows some important features that we need to talk about later. So as we talked about last time, each electronic energy level, whether it's the ground state S0, or the excited states, S and T, single triplet excited states, they also have superimposed vibrational energy levels, which are spaced much, much smaller than the electronic energy levels, but are sort of also an important part of that, and that will give rise to some important features in the photoluminescent spectra that we'll talk about later. In a Jablonski diagram, you're gonna have arrows that designate the different processes that can happen, the different conversions that can occur between different states on your diagram. And there's not really a universal convention for this, but the convention that I'll use, which is pretty common, is that the sort of solid straight line arrows are gonna represent radiative processes. So any process that involves absorption or emission of a photon is gonna be shown with a regular straight line arrow. And then any of the squiggly arrows on the diagram represent non-radiative processes, processes where you convert from one state to another but don't involve absorbing or emitting a photon. All right, and then some other um, abbreviations that will occur, and most of these are concepts that we've already defined. So A is going to represent absorption. We talked about that last time. That's when the photon energy is absorbed to promote from the ground state to a higher energy excited state. F we just described is going to be is going to represent fluorescence, and then P, which we just described, is going to represent phosphorescence. So these are the three possible radiative processes that will be included in a Jablonski diagram. But there are also some other abbreviations that are important to understand the non-radiative processes. So one of those is called vibrational relaxation. So as we'll show and talk about throughout today's talk, you can you can do excitation 
into any of the vibrational energy levels of a given excited state or conversely when you do the reverse process and you do fluorescence or phosphorescence you can also populate any of the vibrational energy levels of the ground state so when you populate one of those higher energy vibrational states typically what's going to happen is very quickly you're going to have vibrational relaxation which means that the energy level is going to quickly go to the lowest vibrational state within that electronic state so you can transiently populate those higher energy vibrational states but that's going to quickly relax to the lowest one we'll see how that looks in the diagram in a little bit and then um, IC is another non-radiative process called internal conversion and so this is a process where you're going to change from one state to another within the same spin multiplicity so if you're in the singlet excited state S1 and you go back to the singlet ground state S0 without emitting a photon, that would be called internal conversion. Sometimes that's just called more generally non-radiative decay, but uh, technically speaking it's internal conversion when, it's, when this is what's exactly happening. Or if you go from like T3 to T2, so you're transitioning between two triple states. It's always going to involve an energetically downhill process typically, so it'll be from a higher energy state to a lower energy state and that can occur without emission of a photon, in which case it's, in, it's going to be labeled as internal conversion. And then the other one is when you cross between different spin multiplicities. So when you go from one state to another where the spin multiplicities are not the same, we call that inter-system crossing abbreviated as ISC. So the most common one is singlet to triplet. That's going to be involved in any sort of phosphorescence, as we'll see. And so when you go from, let's say, S1 to T1, or any singlet state to any triplet state, that would be referred to as inner system crossing. All right, so those are the abbreviations we're going to see in the diagram. So let's, again, watch an animated version of it, and then I'll sort of slow back down and talk about all the different features again. So again, this is the diagram that's each horizontal line is an energy level. So the this horizontal line at the bottom is S0, that's our ground state. We also show on this diagram S1 and S2, so two higher singlet excited states, and then one triplet excited state, T1. And then all the gray lines here represent the vibrational energy levels within each of those states. So this is our S0 lowest vibrational level, and then these ones above that, these are all different vibrational levels within S0. S1 similarly has a bunch of vibrational energy levels, S2 and so on, so all the little lines as closely spaced lines represent vibrational states within each uh, electronic state. All right, so let's watch an animation of what happens, if it lets me. Okay. All right, so again, we start in S0, and typically the first process that would occur is absorption. Absorption can populate S1 directly or S2. If you populate S2, you're going to have vibrational relaxation and internal conversion to S1. From there, you can have fluorescence, or you can have non-radiative decay back to S0. Also, you can have inter-system crossing to T1, which from there you can have phosphorescence, or you can have a non-radiative process that gets you back to S0. So those that went kind of fast for me to describe in real time, so I'll slow back down and show you again with a static picture. Again, blue lines are showing absorption, so this is where we're starting at S0, and we're exciting the molecule to higher energy states. It could, in principle, be others besides S1 and S2, this just shows two of those. And you can see that the absorption can result in population of any of the vibrational energy levels within S2 or S1. Um, now if you populate S2 initially, you're typically going to have a very fast relaxation to S1. So that's going to occur via vibrational relaxation to the lowest vibrational state here, and then IC, which is internal conversion to S1, and that's normally very fast. So before anything else happens, from S1, you're typically going to, or from S2, you'll, you'll, you'll relax to S1. And then once you're in the higher energy vibrational levels within S1, you'll also very quickly relax to this lowest vibrational state. So the point is that if you're going to have fluorescence in your molecule, it's almost always going to originate from S1, as shown here with these green lines. So you're not going to have fluorescence from S2, and you're not going to have fluorescence that starts in these higher energy vibrational levels. It's always going to start from the lowest vibrational energy level of S1. All right, and then once you're in S1, again, there's basically three processes that can happen. Fluorescence, which is radiative decay, non-radiative decay back to S0, which involves internal conversion to S0, vibrational relaxation all the way down to the lowest vibrational state. Or the other process from S1 is if, um, if, if the molecule is able to do this in a relatively quick time scale, you can populate the triple state T1.
So that occurs via inter-system crossing, shown in orange here as ISC. So you go from S1 to T1, that's going to be inter-system crossing. Again, you will, however your inter-system crossing pathway occurs, it could be directly to T1, as I'm showing here, or it could be S1 to T2 or S1 to T3 to a higher triple state. But whatever happens, once you get into that triplet manifold, you're going to quickly relax down to T1, again, before anything else would, would typically happen. And then from the lowest vibrational energy level of T1, you can have two possibilities. You can have phosphorescence, which is radiated decay back to S0, which produces photons, or you can have inter-system crossing back to S0, vibrational relaxation gets you to your ground state without emitting a photon. So one key part of this, there's a few key parts of this diagram that I want to point out. So one is again, the different vibrational energy levels that can be populated. So when you're doing absorption, you always start at the lowest vibrational energy level of S0, but you can populate different vibrational levels within each excited state. Or similarly, when you have fluorescence or phosphorescence, you start at the lowest vibrational energy level, but that can relax to any of the vibrational levels within each of, which, within the respective ground state, in this case S0, same for phosphorescence. So you'll see often multiple peaks in fluorescence or phosphorescence spectra that represent the same electronic transition, in this case T1 to S0, but different vibrational levels within that. So we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Now the other important part that I've talked about is how all of the important excited state processes, all the radiative processes in particular, but also if you had any sort of photochemistry happening, would originate either from S1 or T1, always from the lowest excited state within a given spin manifold and always from the lowest vibrational state within that. Does anybody know what that rule is called? The fact that these photochemical processes always originate from the lowest excited state. Kasha's rule. Yeah, so that's called Kasha's rule. So that's the, probably an important term to know. Um, let me get a pen here. So that's referred to as Kasha's rule. All right, so that's... Um, now, Kasha's rule is, I would say, observed 99.9% .9 of the time. There are rare examples of fluorescence from S2. Like there's a couple of papers on Bodipi that claim that, I mean, I don't know if I 100% believe it, but um, they at least claim that you can get fluorescence from S2 that's so fast that it beats out the internal conversion process. And, but it's very rare to have anything of importance happening from S2, S3, and so on, or T2, T3. Whatever you're going to see, observe, whatever you're going to observe spectroscopically, will typically occur from either S1 if it's fluorescence or T1 if it's phosphorescence. Um, and that's called Kasha's rule. Okay, so those are some things that are shown in a Jablonski diagram, and we will refer back to this a little bit as we go forward and look at spectra. Now, to talk about the, the kinetics a little bit more detail, it's helpful to just think about a simplified Jablonski diagram. So because of Kasha's rule, you don't necessarily need to think about all the different excited states. It's still of sometimes fundamental or practical interest to do that, but in general, as we said, all of the important photochemical processes, which from our standpoint, at least in this chapter, is just going to be either radiative or non-radiative decay, is going to occur from a single excited state. So you can really simplify the Jablonski diagram and just show ground state, whatever that is, usually S0, whatever excited state is important for that molecule, usually S1 or T1 for the types of compounds we'll talk about and study, but you just need to really show that. It's not very common, as we said, for two different excited states to be involved. You usually will always funnel down to one of those excited states really quickly, and then from there, if you're going to observe fluorescence or phosphorescence, it's going to just involve that one state. So this is a very simplified diagram that just shows really the three key processes. Excitation, which populates that state, sometimes by a complicated pathway, but always very quickly, and then from that state, radiative decay, non-radiative decay. And each of those have a rate constant associated with them. So KR for radiative decay, KNR for non-radiative. So KR tells you how fast photons are generated from the excited state. KNR tells you how fast all of those non-radiative processes happen, which usually, in an isolated case, would just be the internal conversion vibrational relaxation processes. So from this, we can write um, a, a rate law for this, for the decay of the excited state. So if we populate the excited state, let's see if we can come up with this on our own before I show you show it to you. So we, re we reviewed kinetics last time as well, and that was for a reason, because now we're going to talk about the kinetics of this process. And there's at least one person in the room who recently took physical chemistry, so they should have learned kinetics as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you... Yes. I don't actually know what they teach in that class, but I'm assuming kinetics <laughs> is one of the things. So 
If we write, we'll write it as a negative uh, exp uh, derivative for now, but okay. So if we populate the excited state, again, fast excitation, so all we really care about is the decay of the excited state, what would be the, the rate law for that? Yeah, so the so it would be k times e s, and then the the so we'll call that k observed if you want to call it that because it's a first order process because it's just a single unimolecular decay. But this k observed is going to be a as we talked about last time when you have two parallel processes, we have radiative and non radiative decay both happening. You're going to have a sum of the two rate constants, so it's going to be k r plus k n r times that excited state population. All right, so that would be the rate law for that, which I covered up now. <laughs> I wanted to show you. I thought I wrote that high enough. I guess not. So there it is in typed out form. So again, the decay of the excited state is a function of two rate constants because it's two parallel processes occurring, as we as we introduced in more generic form last time. And um, we can then do the integrated rate law, which comes into this exponential form where the rate constant again is a sum of two things and that is often written in, in terms of a time constant which is the inverse of that rate constant 1 over kr plus knr which we call the lifetime in our in our terminology all right and so the, the typical units for kr and knr are inverse seconds they're first order rate constants and then the lifetime would be in seconds or some modified unit based on that all right, so that's how the kinetics work, which kind of follows from what we learned last time. The other important parameter for photoluminescence process is the quantum yield, which we're all also very familiar with. So quantum yield is an efficiency measurement in some sense. It tells you the number, it's a ratio of emitted photons to absorbed photons. So again, the molecule will absorb photons to generate the excited states, and then some portion of those will be re-emitted as fluorescence or phosphorescence, and the quantum yield is the ratio of those two. Um, and that is also then dictated by those rate constants. So the other importance of KR and KNR is that they determine what your quantum yield is. Because essentially the quantum yield is how fast is the, are the photons being generated divided by how fast everything is happening. The generation of photons plus whatever else deactivates that excited state. So it's like a competition between those two. And then it allows you, if you have those two terms, you can rearrange this and calculate KR or KNR in this way. So as we'll talk about more in the next chapter, when we talk about experimental techniques in photoluminescence, typically you're going to measure the quantum yield in the lifetime. Those are your two measurables, and from there you can get KR and KNR, as we're all very familiar with, as most of us are very familiar with, I should say. All right, so 5PL is usually reported as a fraction between 0 and 1, or sometimes as a percentage, 0 to 100%. And for most applications of photoluminescence, again, that's a separate chapter that will come to you at the very end. For most applications, you want the photoluminescence quantum yield to be as high as possible. It's not really usually a detriment to having it as high as possible. So that's a research challenge that we're all familiar with. Okay, so then the, let's talk about some of the characteristics of fluorescence. So we're going to look at some simulated fluorescence spectra now to understand how they would actually look when you record them. So what we're showing in these diagrams, the blue trace is going to be the absorption band, assuming we just have a simple S0 to S1 absorption, so just a single absorption band, S0 to S1, and then the fluorescence that comes from S1 to S0. Now what you'll notice is that those two, in an ideal sense, are mirror images of each other, because they're basically the opposite process. One goes from S0 to S1, one goes the opposite, and there's always a little bit of a shift between the two. And we call that shift the Stokes shift, um, abbreviated here is E-Stokes. So that's the difference between the two maxima of fluorescence and, and absorption. So that, and it has to correspond to the same electronic transition. So if you're, if you're measuring a Stokes shift, it's important to, to know that your absorption band represents S0 to S1, which is the, again, corresponding electronic transition that goes with fluorescence being S1 to S0. So that shift is given there. We'll talk a little bit later about what determines how big this shift is. Um, when you report a Stokes shift, a lot of people in the literature do it in terms of nanometers. So they'll just measure the peak in nanometers for the absorption, the peak in nanometers for the fluorescence, and they'll subtract the two. That's not really the best way to do it, though, because as we talked about last time, wavelength is not 
directly proportional to energy. So if you have a 30 nanometer stoke shift between 300 and 330, that's going to be a much different energy gap than the same 30 nanometer stoke shift between 600 and 630, let's say. So it's better to report it in either wave numbers or energy units because then it allows you to do an apples apples comparison between different parts of the spectrum. All right, so that's a typical fluorescent spectrum. Now, what you can also sometimes see, especially if you cool down the sample and restrict the motion of the solvent, restrict the sort of vibrational modes within the molecule, is you can actually resolve the different vibronic transitions. So let's go back a little bit to the Jablonski diagram. Um, where is it? Okay. So remember that within each of these excited states, you have um, different vibrational energy levels. So when we're going from, if we're doing fluorescence, we're going from S1 back to the ground state, again, it can go to any of these vibrational energy levels. And so you can often then see separate peaks. And the way that we label these is this is the V equals zero, or the zero with vibrational level of S1, and then this would be the 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, vibrational levels of S0. So the 0, 0 is the one where we go from V equals 0 to V equals 0 in the ground state. 0, 1 would be 0 to 1, so that'd be this line here. So this, this is 0, 0, this is 0, 1, this is 0, 2, and this is 0, 3. So they're labeled by virtue of where you start, which is always 0, and then where it terminates, which can be any of those other vibrational levels within the ground state. Okay, so that's what we have. And um, so what you can sometimes see, if, again, especially if you're at really low temperatures when you're doing your measurement, is you can resolve those different vibronic states. And they'll look at like separate peaks, but it's all the same electronic transition, just different vibrational coupled uh, things that can, that can be, that can be um, observed as well along with that. Um, now, so really in these two spectra here, what's interesting about this simulation is that both of them have the same E00 value, so that's the energy of that 00, zero transition. Both of these are the same. Both of them have the same vibronic spacing between their vibrational energy levels. The only difference here is how broad the peaks are. So peak broadening is, is a complicated topic that I'm not gonna talk about a lot, but it occurs for a lot of reasons, but primarily in solution, you know, for the types of samples that you guys work with, the, the, the broadening occurs because of different interactions with the solvent, those, those interactions, you know, the, the electronic transitions are vertical in a sense, they occur at a very fast time scale, so the solvent's not gonna be rearranging on that time scale. So you basically have different snapshots in time where the solvent is arranged a little bit differently and those interactions can then cause the, the lines to broaden, the energy levels kind of smear out a little bit. Um, but if you're at really low temperatures or in certain types of compounds, this occurs anyway, even at room temperature, you get much sharper peaks and then you're, allowed, you're able to resolve them much better. So this is kind of an extreme example where you can resolve those. And what you'll see then is that the E00 energy is gonna be represented right where the absorption and the emission cross each other. So in this diagram here, I keep losing my pen, um, that crossover point right there is gonna give you E00 which corresponds to 500 nanometer, which is 20,000 wave numbers. So where those two cross is E00, it also is true here as well. And when you have really sharp vibronic structure, those two can almost lie right on top of each other. Um, and the soak shift is always gonna be defined as the distance between the two peak maxima. So in this particular spectrum, the zero one peak is the, the tallest. So soak shift will be defined as the difference between those two tallest peaks. All right. All right, so that's a definition of stoke shift that I already kind of referred to. Again, best to report it in either wave numbers or electron volts and energy unit. Um, although sometimes people don't agree with me on that. And then, um, again, the vibronic structure occurs because of different transitions to different vibrational energy levels. And the absorption, those are populating different vibrational energy levels within S1. In the fluorescent spectrum in green, that means relaxing to different vibrational energy levels within S0. And how well resolved those are depends on a lot of different factors, the type of compound, the type of excited state, the solvent you're using, the temperature, all that stuff. So you guys are, if you've done fluorescence before, you're familiar with how, in a lot of cases, they are sort of simple, single broad peaks like this, but vibronic structure can occur as well. Um, 
and give you some important information. So that's what typical fluorescent spectra look like. Now what determines the sort of shape of the vibronic structure as well as that Stokes shift is what's called the Huang Reese parameters. Now I'm not going to go through a detailed mathematical treatment of these, but basically what they qualitatively refer to is the um, distortion between the ground state and the excited state. So we talked about last time how these energy levels can be represented as potential energy wells. In reality, they're anharmonic. I'm just showing harmonic pictures here for simplicity. Um, but when you go from the ground state to the excited state, typically that involves populating antibonding orbitals. And so when you do that, you cause the bonds to lengthen a little bit. And so that shifts the potential energy surface to the right. And that's why all these are displaced a little bit to the right relative to the ground state. And how much they're displaced is sort of proportional or related to the Huang Reese parameter. So with a small Huang Reese parameter S, the S0 and S1 are kind of on top of each other. But as the Huang Reese parameter gets larger and larger, the S1 distorts more and more in, in the horizontal sense relative to S0. And so what that results in is different vibrational or different vibronic transitions being more or less favored. So when you have a small Huang Reese parameter, you have pretty good wave function overlap between these lowest vibrational energy levels. Those are basically right vertically on top of each other. So you'll typically see a really large zero zero transition both for absorption and emission if you can resolve the, the vibronic structure. But as the S value gets larger and larger, we see that these vertical transitions tend to populate higher energy vibrational levels. So the absorption goes from zero to one most likely because that's the vertical overlap there. Or when you go from, when you do the vertical transition from here, again, it tends to line up better with that, that V equals one state. And then it goes even further than that. So as the, as the Huang Reese parameter gets larger and larger, those higher order of ironic transitions 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on, or you know, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, those get more and more likely, and then those peaks tend to get larger and larger, and that sort of distorts that. And so um, that's the definition there. So here's some simulated spectra, very similar to the last ones I showed, where we're varying the Huang Reese parameter. So 1.1, that's the value I used for the spectra I showed you before. So these two middle ones are identical before. But with a small Huang Reese parameter, we tend to have a smaller Stokes shift. So the Stokes shift is directly related to, to the Huang Reese parameter. As, as that distortion between the ground state and the excited state get bigger and bigger, the Stokes shift gets larger and larger. And that's true both when you have you know, poorly resolved vibronic structure like we have here or really well resolved vibronic structure. We also notice in the cases where the vibronic structure is re relatively well resolved, we see when you have a small Huang Reese parameter, the zero zero transitions are the, are the most likely and they have the highest intensity. But as the Huang Reese parameter gets bigger and bigger. In this one, we see that it was 0, 1 that were the tallest. And here, 0, 2 and 0, 1 are pretty similar to each other. So as you shift the Huang Reese parameter larger and larger, these higher order peaks become more and more probable, and they become they gain intensity relative to the, the 0, 0 peak. All right, so that's the effect of the Huang Reese parameter on both the vibronic structure and the Stokes shift. So the Stokes shift is proportional. And then the height of a vibronic peak is given by this equation here. So this is the relative height, the fractional height, I guess, of, of one of these um, vibronic peaks in the spectrum. This is how I simulated these spectra. And so it's given by this function here, where S is the Huang Reese parameter and N is the value of the vibronic state that you're terminating in. So for the zero, zero transition, N is zero. For the zero, one transition, N is one. And so you plug those in along with the Huang Reese parameter S, and that tells you the relative heights of the peaks. And that's how you would simulate that and sort of rationalize that. So in principle, then, if you have a spectrum with well-resolved vibronic structure, you can sort of fit it to this equation to figure out what your Huang Reese parameter S would be. That's typically how it's measured by evaluation of the, of the um, vibronic structure. And there's some approximations you can take to get that as well. So we, we're not going to really cover that too much, but that parameter is important for determining the shape of the vibronic structure as well as how big that Stokes shift is. All right, so here we're looking at a typical phosphorescence spectrum. Now, in reality, it's not common for the same compound to have fluorescence and phosphorescence at the same time, particularly from the same type of excited state. But if that, if that is possible, so let's say, you know, there are some organic molecules, like some of the ones that Morris works with, sometimes those highly conjugated pyrenes and things, where at room temperature, you primarily observe fluorescence, but if you cool it down, you can also see phosphorescence. So it is sometimes possible to see both. And if that's the case, the phosphorescence tends to be very significantly redshifted from fluorescence. Because as we showed in the Jablonski diagram, 
the T1 state, the triplet state, is lower in energy than S1, and so that results in a longer wavelength. So you'll have a, a larger shift towards longer wavelengths when you have phosphorescence. That's one characteristic of it. So it's uncommon to observe both, but here this, this is showing them both, fluorescence in green, phosphorescence in red. Um, and the vibronic structure, again, you can sometimes see it in phosphorescence, sometimes you don't. Um, but it's usually, in this case, not going to be a mirror image of the absorption. So if you look closely at these vibronic structures here, the vibronic structure in the absorption and the fluorescence is different than the vibronic structure in phosphorescence. And that's because the S0, the S1 and T1 states usually have different values of the huang reach parameter S that I introduced last time. Um, so you won't normally see the same vibronic structure, but it can be related and it can be, you know, somewhat related, somewhat correlated with the, the S1 vibronic structure as well. Now another thing that happens a lot in the literature that is, um, that is wrong, and I just want to point it out as, as being so, is a lot of people say, well, one characteristic of phosphorescence is a large stoke shift. But it's not really correct to say that because even though you have a large gap between the phosphorescence peak and the absorption peak, the precise definition of stoke shift is that it refers to transitions with the same electronic origin. In this case, the absorption is S0 to S1. That's normally what you see for absorption. But the phosphorescence is T1 to S0. It involves two different excited states. So it's not, it's not correct to just report that, uh, that difference in energy and say that's the stoke shift for phosphorescence. That's not really a stoke shift at all because it's two different electronic transitions. If you want to determine the stoke shift for phosphorescence, you need to resolve the S0 to T1 absorption band, which is usually not easy to do. In some compounds you can see, as some of the iridium compounds we work with, you can see what looks to be an S0 to T1 absorption band. And then you would take the difference between that and the phosphorescence as your stoke shift. But in reality, it's not usually possible to easily determine the stoke shift for phosphorescence. Um, so the corresponding absorption can't be resolved. All right, so that's, that's the, you know, so one characteristic of phosphorescence, if you're trying to, you know, you're running an experiment and you're trying to distinguish, is this molecule, you know, doing fluorescence or phosphorescence? This isn't the most definitive. But if you have a really large shift in wavelength between your absorption and your emission, that usually means it's phosphorescence. In most cases, with fluorescence, there will at least be some overlap between the absorption and the, and the emission, but not always. So, so that's one key to look at, but it's not the only thing you need to consider. Some other differences between fluorescence and phosphorescence come from their different lifetimes. We talked about lifetime earlier as being the um, sort of the time scale at which these different photoluminescent processes occur and typically fluorescence and phosphorescence have very different lifetimes associated with them. So for fluorescence you typically have nanosecond lifetimes. It's very rare to see anything longer than 100. In most cases it's 10 nanoseconds or less I would say. So around 1 to 10 nanoseconds is probably most common for fluorescence. Whereas for phosphorescence those lifetimes can span a wide range of values but usually they're more than 100 nanoseconds. We, there's probably rare examples where that's not the case but it's very rare to see phosphorescence with lifetime less than 100 and it could be as long as milliseconds or even seconds depending on what kind of compound you're studying. Microseconds for the type of stuff we do is most common but um, if you're talking about you know phosphorescence for organic molecules, pure organic molecules, those can be really long. Um, and they tend to be much longer than fluorescence, as, as I said here. The other thing which is particularly important for the project that Gardini is going to work on with Greg is the difference in the oxygen sensitivity between fluorescence and phosphorescence. So if you record the fluorescence spectra in the presence of different amounts of O2, typically you won't see much of a change in intensity. There might be a, a small decrease because it is sometimes possible to do you know, electron transfer from S1 to oxygen or something like that, but it's usually not very efficient because of the short lifetime for fluorescence in particular, um, and because it's two different spin states. Fluorescence occurs from a single state, and then O2 is a triplet. Um, and so in that case, you would have usually really very minimal or no noticeable effect from oxygen. But for phosphorescence, if you add oxygen to the sample, then you would see reduction in the phosphorescence intensity, what we call quenching is the, the term for that. And that occurs by what's called triple to triple annihilation. We'll actually talk about that a little bit more in detail in later chapters in this, in this course. But your triple state T1, which you form prior to phosphorescence, can react with triplet O2. And so it does a triple to triple annihilation process where the two triplets do energy transfer and produce two singlets, where singlet O2 is an excited state of oxygen and then S0 back to your ground state for the, um, for the phosphorescent molecule.
So that reduces the phosphorescence because you're basically eliminating your T1 state via this non-radiative pathway. So when you add oxygen in a sample, if your emission intensity goes down, that usually means it's phosphorescence. Um, so that's one way to test the difference between them. So the combination of you know, the spectral shift between the absorption and the emission, the lifetime and the oxygen sensitivity, usually that's enough to determine pretty clearly whether it's fluorescence or phosphorescence that you're observing. And, and so that's a good way, if your compound is not reactive to oxygen in particular, that's a good way to distinguish them. So if you're not sure, just, you know, so we, what we usually do is, you guys are familiar with who've worked in the lab so far um, for a while, when we're preparing samples for photoluminescence measurements, we usually, especially if we expect phosphorescence, we prepare those inside the glove box so that there's no oxygen around, because that's how we'll get our maximum phosphorescence intensity and our accurate quantum yield. And then if you add oxygen to the sample, what you should see if it's phosphorescence is a reduction in that intensity. Now there's one other mechanism of photoluminescence that I want to cover that we haven't talked about yet, and that's called thermally activated delayed fluorescence. I just gave the abbreviation here, so let me write it out. No, don't go to that. Um, all right, so this is TADF. And I don't think we've ever made a TADF compound in our lab, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Uh, so there's a few different, we'll talk about some classes of maybe a little bit of TADF in the last chapter, or the second last chapter. The most common TADF compounds are, um, are like, are, are charge transfer organic molecules where the, um, well, let me, let, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's describe what it is first. Okay, so um, TADF occurs when you have a pretty small gap between your S1 and your T1 states. So in the typical phosphorescent compounds like we work with, you have a pretty large separation between S1 and T1. Oh, come on. My ham hands, I can't do this. Um, so in most compounds, you have a pretty large separation between S1 and T1. So once you populate the T1 state, you can't go back to S1. You're, you're there and you're going to have phosphorescence and, and that's, that's the end of the story. But in TADF materials, what you have is a small gap between S1 and T1 such that the inner system crossing process becomes reversible. So ISC is going to be, again, the crossover from S1 to T1, as I'm showing here. But you can also have what's referred to as reverse intersystem processing, RISC, where you go from T1 back to S1 if they're close enough in energy to each other. So the way that TADF usually works then is we're going to simplify the kinetics a little bit here. So we're going to just call KS1 is just going to be the inverse of the lifetime. So it's just going to be the sum of the two rate constants, KR and KNR, from S1. And then KT1 is going to be the sum of the KR and KNR from T1. So we're just going to call those um, just simple rate constants to keep things easy here. And so what happens is you'll excite to S1. Intersystem crossing is relatively fast, so you'll get population of T1. But when you're in S1, there's two things that can happen. So you can have what's called prompt fluorescence. So prompt fluorescence is fluorescence that occurs directly from S1 before going to T1. So that's called your prompt fluorescence. But then the delay fluorescence is when you do intersystem crossing to T1 first. T1 has typically in these compounds has a really long lifetime and doesn't emit very readily. But then what you have is reverse intersystem crossing and then your delayed fluorescence. So you can usually have prompt and delayed fluorescence. Prompt fluorescence occurring directly from S1. Delayed fluorescence occurs after intersystem crossing followed by reverse intersystem crossing. Now, because you park your excited state in this T1 state for a period of time, one of the characteristics of TADF is that it typically has really long lifetime compared to typical fluorescence. So the spectrum will look like fluorescence, typically, because you're emitting from S1, so it, is, it really is fluorescence, but your lifetime will be exceptionally long because you're going to T1 first for that delayed fluorescence before coming back and doing the fluorescence. So you sit here for a while, nothing happens in T1, and then you'll go back to S1 and fluoresce. So your prompt fluorescence would have a really short decay time, but your delayed fluorescence has a really long lifetime. So these are usually going to occur, as we said, when the gap between S1 and T1 is small. And as we'll talk about in the next slide, it is temperature dependent. But usually the typical you know, room temperature TADF processes are going to occur when you have – 
a single triplet gap of less than 0.3 EV or less than 2400 wave numbers. That's pretty small. And in most cases, it's actually even smaller than that, less than 0.1 EV or 800 wave numbers. That's a pretty small gap between S1 and T1. I think our, we don't know exactly what it is in our radium compounds, but they're usually on the order of probably like five or 6,000, at least twice this much. So for TADF, you need a, a pretty small gap compared to what we normally see. Now to get back to the question on what kinds of things do TADF, the most conventional types of compounds, I don't know if this exact one does it, but this one would give you kind of the idea of what they look like, um, is, are what are called donor acceptor twists, and they usually have twisted excited states. So I'm not going to be able to draw the twisted forms. That requires me to draw in three dimensions, and I can barely draw in two because um, I have terrible motor skills and all that stuff. So let's say you have something like this. I don't know if this one actually does TADF or not, but typical TADF compounds look like this, where it's, it's, it's a charge transfer donor receptor chromophore where you'd have your HOMO is mainly localized on the electron-rich part of the molecule. Let me get the pointer back. So your HOMO would be localized here, your LUMO would be localized here. So the excited state basically involves a charge transfer between the electron-rich and electron-poor parts of the molecule. But then what happens is if the two rings are rotated relative to each other, the HOMO and the LUMO have you know, very little coupling with each other because they're spatially separated and they're rotated relative to each other. And so in that case, you don't have a lot of exchange interactions between the electrons and the triplet state. And that reduces your triplet excited state gap. Because the reason T1 is below S1 is primarily because of that quantum mechanical exchange interaction. When you have, oh my gosh, I wish there was a faster way to switch between those. It's like when you have your HOMO and your LUMO, and if it's, a, if it's a triple state where the two electrons are the same spin, whenever you have two electrons of the same spin, those are referred to, those can exchange, those can have interactions that are called exchange, and that's a stabilizing interaction. Um, again, I don't know if they teach this in the undergrad PCHEM courses, but if you guys took the graduate level PCHEM, I'm sure they talk about exchange at some level here, for those of you that were fortunate or unfortunate enough to take that course. Um, so anyway, you have those exchange interactions that result in the T1 state being lower in energy than S1, but when you have a chromophore like this, where the HOMO and the LUMO are far apart from each other, and especially when they're twisted and not able to overlap at all, then you don't have very strong exchange interactions. Those electrons are not spatially localized at all, and so they don't interact very well, and that makes your single triplet gap really small. So that's typically how TADF materials work. But there are some metal complexes, like some copper chromophores that are not too different than stuff Duyung is working on, as well as the zirconium stuff that like Carson Millsman has done recently. So there are metal complexes, charge transfer chromophores of metal that also have these small single triple gaps and are able to do TADF. So that's kind of the theoretical background about TADF. The last things I'll talk about are some sort of experimental or things that you can look at to understand if TADF is occurring or not. So one thing you can look at is the temperature dependence of the spectra. Um, because that reverse interstitial crossing process, because it's endothermic, it requires you to go from T1 back up to S1, that's going to have a pretty steep temperature dependence associated with it. So if you go to lower and lower temperatures, you're going to slow down that reverse interstitial crossing pathway. And eventually, if you get to a low enough temperature, you're just going to have phosphorescence. So go back to the diagram a little bit. Um, when you have that reverse interstitial crossing process, if you cool down the temperature to a low enough value, you, this no longer occurs anymore, or it's very slow, and that means you basically just switch over to straight up phosphorescence eventually. We can't go back to the S1 state. So as you change the temperature of your spectrum, what you'll see is that initially you're getting that delayed fluorescence which occurs at higher energy, but then as you cool it down, it shifts over to more pure phosphorescence emission, or at intermediate temperatures, the phosphorescence and the delayed fluorescence will be competitive with each other, and you'll kind of see both of them sort of overlaid with each other. Um, so that's what it would look like. Now normally we know that when we do temperature dependent spectra, we see a blue shift, if anything, because of the regidochromic effect. In TADF, it's the opposite. You typically see a red shift when you cool it down. And that's because that reverse interstitial crossing process gets shut off and you now emit from the lower energy triplet state instead. So that's your typical temperature dependence. These again are simulated spectra with, um, I don't know, with a peak width of 2,000 wave numbers and then the single triple gap of 1,500. So that kind of intermediate value there. Um, so again, reverse interstitial crossing is endothermic, so it's temperature dependence. So at high temperature, you have primarily delayed fluorescence and you're 
emission band is going to look a lot like regular fluorescence would from the S1 state, but then when you go to low temperature, it switches over primarily to phosphorescence. Now, as you can also imagine, because of that switch over from delayed fluorescence to phosphorescence, that also has a pretty big effect on the observed lifetime. So the other way to distinguish TADF is to do temperature dependent lifetimes, and this is what it'll typically look like. So this is actually the inverse of the lifetime, the K observed, um, one over the lifetime. And it's given by this equation here. So basically you can you record the lifetime at different temperatures, you fit it to the inverse of the temperature, or the or the um, or one over the T here, and you fit it to this function, and that allows you to back out those inherent rate constants for S1 and T1, as well as the energy gap between the two. So this is how you get those parameters that I talked about, and this is also, again, further evidence that it's going to be, um, you know, TADF. Now, what's interesting here, though, is, you know, you can see how big of an effect the TADF has on the lifetime. So when we're at, um, let's say we're at 300 Kelvin, which is room temperature here. Uh, so in this simulated data here, the lifetime of prompt fluorescence, the direct decay from S1 to S0 is 33 nanoseconds, pretty typical fluorescence lifetime. And then the lifetime for T1 is really long, one millisecond. And so even though at high temperatures, you're mostly getting that delayed fluorescence, you still see a huge effect on the lifetime. So at 300 Kelvin, our K observed is roughly, what, 10 to the minus two, three, 10 to the minus two about. And that corresponds to a lifetime of, did I plot this on the right scale? I don't know if I screwed this up or not. Um, but anyway, it's the, the lifetime is dramatically longer than this 33, 33 nanoseconds. Um, you won over that, so. Why am I not able to do this in my head? About 0.1 millisecond, about 100 microseconds, I think. I don't know if I'm doing that right or not, I'm sorry. Um, it's possible I didn't plot this correctly. But anyway, even though the inherent fluorescence lifetime for this is 33 nanoseconds, at room temperature, because of that reverse inter-system processing process, the lifetime goes up into the microsecond range or higher. So it's a huge effect in the lifetime. So again, if you if you if you you know observe an emission spectrum that looks like fluorescence but it has a super long lifetime, like microseconds or longer, that usually means TADF is occurring. And if you can measure the temperature dependence of the lifetime, that allows you to back out those inherent rate constants from the T1 and S1 states, as well as the energy gap between them, which gives you the full picture that that I showed you. So those are some, I think that's the last slide. Um, so that's, again, another mechanism that we didn't really, we don't really see in our research, but it's, it's an important one. And it's, it's also important just as a little background for, um, for OLEDs because it's, the, it's really the other way of getting 100% exciton harvested is with TADF. Um, because again, in TADF materials, you can harvest the triplet excitons to get to your T1 state, and then you can go back and emit from S1. So, they call TADF materials third generation OLED materials, I think is the terminology they use. But basically, it's the other way besides phosphorescence to get 100% exciton harvesting in OLEDs and get those really high efficiencies that you want for commercial devices. All right, so that's everything that I had planned to cover today. Are there any questions on what we went over? Okay. Um, so I will I will stop there and stop the video recording so I don't forget to do that. Um, and I'll be posting this online as I, as I normally do. Uh, so that'll be available later today.